Our call to worship for this Sunday after the 4th of July comes from the, our bulletin. The congregation's response is in the darker print. We came from all places and all peoples to gather here today. We found a land blessed. Here a dream was born. We have turned to nations and peoples who gave us birth. And so the dream continues. Amen. Thank you. You may be. Our invitation for the Lord's table this day 
is found in the bulletin along with the prayer of confession. And I invite you to go to that place now and let us enter into this time of proclamation and response with our invitation to the Lord's table. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him. All who love him who earnestly repent of their sin and who seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. At this time, we invite our children to please come forward as we have our children's message. to stand down here so that I can see your eyes. That is important to me, to be able to see you. Now, I was in the parlor. Do y'all know where the parlor is in our church? You don't know where the parlor is? It's that room with all that nice furniture right across the hall, okay? It's got all the nice furniture in it, and there is on that table a a a bowl of fruit. I think that's a pear. Okay? Do you think you want to eat that? It's made out of glass. You probably shouldn't. These are probably, I don't know how long they've been there. They're very, very nice. I'll just show you two. So you show you some of them. See, there's a pear, there's a lemon. I think that's a fig, grapes. Is that an apple? You think that's an apple? I don't know. Is that an apple? That's an apple. Yeah? I think that's a pear. No, that's not a pear. That's a peach. Oh. It's a peach. Okay? All right. Have a seat. Now, I like the fruit basket in the parlor because there's all kinds of things that you can understand about fruit in the church that we live by the fruits of the Spirit. But today, Jesus talks about pears. No, he doesn't talk about this kind of pear. There's a different, this is the pear, P-E-A-R, right? But he talks about pears, P-A-I-R. Pears are two, right? There's a pear, there's two. And he talks about sending people out in pairs, all right? And sending them out to do God's work two by two by two. They would go out into these towns and tell people about Jesus and they would, they would uh, love people just like Jesus did. But the thing is, if you get two people, they're not exactly alike. One might be like a, a pear and the other one might be like an apple or another pair of people might be like a grape and the other one could be like a lemon. But here's the thing I've come to know. 
that if you put all these pears, to, if you put all of this fruit together, you make a wonderful, what we call a fruit salad. And the, and the fruit just complements each other and it makes everything taste good. And the thing that I've come to know about being in church and being a Christian is that we don't go and do things by ourselves. Just like a fruit salad is great with as many different kinds of fruit in it, the church is wonderful and blessed and great because people come together. We don't do faith by ourselves. We do it with somebody. There's somebody to teach you in Sunday school. There's somebody to help you in your work. They're at school or at home. One of the things that Jesus tells us is that we go together as a church. We go together as Christians. So the next time you're in that parlor, look at the fruit in the bowl and think about your time with Jesus. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for these children. We pray, oh Lord, that you will watch over them and keep them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank y'all for coming today. the gospel lesson to the middle of the congregation because in this reading and in this lesson we understand that Christ in the, is in the midst of us. Here now our gospel lesson from the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke chapter 10 verses 1 through 11 and then 16 through 20. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals. Greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its peop people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, Go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, 
we wipe off against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me. And whoever rejects you rejects me. And whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submitted to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, nevertheless, do not rejoice at this that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of this, the holy word of our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Will you pray with me? O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's that time of year again. Time to assemble the ingredients. A couple of slices of fresh bread. Preferably white bread. A little bit of mayonnaise. A couple of shakes of fresh black pepper. And a nice, fresh, Red, juicy, there you go. It's time for a good tomato sandwich. Many of us enjoy that symbol of sum summer, don't we? It's the savory result of many things. Good mayonnaise, good bread that comes together. The end of our scripture lesson this morning is like that happy experience of a good tomato sandwich on a summer day. In Luke chapter 10, when the 70 come back, the disciples exclaim, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. It sounds like a scene where congratulatory handshakes and high fives are shared all around. We could almost hear in the background the hymn, Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? It's a moment of sweet triumph over evil. It's a celebration of how peace was offered and the nearness of the Lord proclaimed to the villages and towns from Samaria, where Jesus and the disciples were, those villages and towns on the way to Jerusalem. Those were towns and villages where the disciples did their mission work, where the 70 were sent. That's the end of the story. But it's not the only 
part of the story. Most of us would be content to yank these two or three verses out at the end and make them kind of some kind of template for our lives and for our faith. If we just hold on to these verses, life is supposed to go smoothly because we have faith. If we adopt only the end of the story as our template of life, then when life and faith do not go well, there must be something wrong with us. Because whenever we hurt or doubt or fail and are somehow deficient and holding on to this scripture, there's no other conclusion. We must be doing something wrong. Adversity and challenge appear to us in our lives as marks of unfaithfulness and failure. The glory at the end of the reading did not just magically appear. The end of the story is far removed from its beginning when Jesus sent out the 70 with some pretty austere instructions. As football season approaches, you may have your favorite pregame speech or saying of your favorite co football coach. But Jesus' instructions to the 70 may not make it to the top of your list. Jesus basically says, hey, here's what I want you to do. Go ahead of me in teams of two. Go into these villages where we haven't been before. Go to the people in the towns that you don't know. But I don't want you to take any supplies with you. Don't move around trying to find a better place. And I know I'm sending you out like a lamb to a pack of wolves. Eat whatever they put in front of you. Don't do any kind of pre-qualifications to see which house might be better receptive. Just go knocking on doors and stay with those people that are receptive to your message. While you're there, I want you to cure their diseases, offer them peace, and tell everybody, even the ones that don't want to hear you, that the kingdom of God has come near. And so the 70, which turns out, as I found out in a Sunday school class, is 35 pairs go out in teams of two. Two by two, they go to these unknown villages. Two people. Yes, I guess this is for accountability purposes, to keep one straight while the other one looked on. But they were also there to support one another, to help one another. Because disciples don't go at life alone. They go with other people. The pairs, as they went out in these different villages, would laugh together and cry together. They would be there when things went swimmingly well and people were healed, when people received the good news that the kingdom was near. Oh, it was a great and glorious time when things were going good. But they would also be there to witness to one another and pick each other up and help each other in the hard times. Times when people were ugly or rude or threatening or worse. They would pick each other up by the power and mercy of God that was revealed in one another. In those times and places where the message of their peace was rejected, the pairs would dust each other off as they shook off the dust of the place and the people that did not accept them. And they would dust themselves off when they stumbled and made mistakes and failed. They dusted themselves off. They persisted. They moved on. They taught and healed and found receptive people in other places. And they failed in some other places as well. They learned from their mistakes and failures because failure and struggle are part of our journey. Jesus knew that. 
Jesus says to the 70 in his instructions to, to them, whenever you enter a town and they don't welcome you, what a great word, whenever. It's not conditional as with if. If they don't welcome you, whenever is definite, there will be those that reject, that do not welcome the disciples. Jesus knew that there would be places where they would not be welcome. There would be other places where they failed to make a connection. They would face adversity and challenge and even defeat. And Jesus knew defeat. Good Friday comes before Easter Sunday. The journey of faith is not an antiseptic ride free of bumps and bruises. Faith does not inoculate us from doubt and trouble. Faith is our companion through the bruises of life. And faith is strengthened in the adversity that we face. I love a good tomato sandwich in the summer. I've seen some beautiful tomatoes in the farmer's market. But the best tomato sandwich I had came from a less than perfect tomato. It was misshapen. It was ugly. It was certainly not as big as the one some of you grow or like you find in the grocery store. It was not like a tomato that I bought, that I had bought in the store so many times, a beautiful red, round, big masterpiece that I picked from a pile of perfect tomatoes. No, the best tomato that I ever saw was one I grew myself. When we served a church in Charleston, I picked up a couple of containers to try and my hand at gardening. I had a man in the church telling me what to do down there and I planted those tomatoes in the soil that he told me. I looked at those plants every morning. I'd go out there and make sure they had enough light. I watered those plants. I overwatered those plants. I don't think I ever got the right amount of fertilizer on those plants. I worried every time I saw a hole in a leaf or some discoloration. And finally, when a few blossomed blossoms pushed their way out of that plant, I was on cloud nine. I watched those little misshapen tomatoes struggle and grow and I struggled with them. Then there was the day. I picked that ugly, imperfect tomato, but fully ripe, off the vine. And I took it inside. I don't know, I don't think I got but one tomato this year, that year and this was it. And I took that tomato inside and I sliced it so carefully and I put the mayonnaise on the bread and I put the, the, the pepper on it and it was the best tomato sandwich I ever had. And what made it the best tomato sandwich was not its shape or color. What made it the best tomato sandwich I ever had was that it was seasoned with the full experience that I had growing that one tomato. In the good times and in the bad, I learned. We also learned that faith is not a completed project that we purchase like that perfect tomato in the store. Our faith grows in the sunlight and in the storms of our lives. And sometimes we overwater it. Other times we don't nurture it enough. 
but we learn and grow from our failures and we become stronger. The demons that submitted to the 70 weren't just the ones that plagued the townspeople. Some of the most pernicious and vile demons are not out there in the world. They are the ones that quietly stalk us and shadow our lives. These demons that are up close and personal frolic in our pain and uncertainty and they amplify our doubts about ourselves. They tell us we're not good enough. They sow skepticism about our worthiness as the children of God. These are the dem demons that twist our faith and tell us that good and faithful children of God avoid conflict, avoid struggle, and avoid a challenge. Because if you know challenge and struggle and conflict, then you are a failure and aren't good enough for God to love. Part of the triumph of the 70 at the end of this reading comes from the fact that they dusted themselves off and tried again. That they faced their demons and by the power of God they submitted to the Lord. Part of the triumph is that the 70 went forward and they learned and they grew from their mistakes. They claim the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding as their constant companion. They learn that in good times and in bad, in faithfulness and in doubt, in fruitfulness and in failure, the kingdom of God is always near. And that was a more than a message that was taught or sung or preached. It was a life that was lived. With all of life, faith as well as tomato sandwiches, we rejoice. Because our names are written in heaven, we know the power of redemption and transformation. Because our names are written in heaven, Failure and doubt are not the last word. Because our names are written in heaven, we can dust ourselves off and pick ourselves up from the failures we endure and proclaim the good news. Because our names are written in heaven, even the demons will have no lasting power over us because our names are written in heaven we rejoice in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen and now as a response to the word of God proclaimed among us let us recite the Apostles Creed the affirmation of faith the traditional version found on page 881. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As we gather today for our time of prayer, we are mindful of many things that are happening in our lives, in our community. Many of you know of the loss of the Louder family home this past week, of all the memories, of all the 
grandness of that structure, but also of the hurt and loss that family feels. So let us pray for Clay Louder and his family. Greer Blackwelder uh, is going to have knee replacement surgery this week, so we invite you to pray for him. And we want to also remember uh, that uh, Gloria Tessiner died, mother of Jonathan. And as we were talking about it in the early service when Jonathan was here, Jonathan did right by his mother. He honored his mother and his father and all of the care that he could give. And we're thankful for the life of Gloria and the ways that she shaped Jonathan and helped him be the man that he is. We pray for Buddy Gulledge and the loss of his brother. We also pray for Dr. Strobel, who was hit by a car this past week uh, while he was riding his bicycle. Got doing okay, but uh, please keep him in your prayers as well. Friends, I invite you to join me in prayer. Gracious and everlasting God, for this day, for this time, we turn to you. We turn to you for the brokenness in our community that comes with accidents and fires. We come to you praying for those that have been faithful unto death and now have crossed the threshold to life triumphant and everlasting. We pray for those who grieve. We pray, O oh Lord, for your church. Hear our prayers for those in the hospital and in nursing homes. We're thankful for the ministry that extends the table this day, O oh Lord, to members and friends that can hear us on the radio, but by the careful de dedication and service of this church, can receive the sacrament this day. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for our sins and shortcomings, for the times that we have not been obedient to you, the times that we have been content in our failure not to try again, for the times that we've been hurt and broken and not reached out, and for the times we've seen others hurt and broken and not reached out to them. Guide us as your people. These things we ask in your name. Amen. And now will our ushers please come forward for the dedication of our tithes and offerings. Help me. 
Thank you. You may be seated. I invite you to turn to page 15 of your hymnal for the congregation's response for the prayer of the great thanksgiving. Today I am using a prayer of the great thanksgiving for Independence Day. This comes to us from the General Board of Discipleship of the United Methodist Church, and it is appropriate for this national holiday. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Almighty God, creator of the universe, ruler of all nations, judge of all flesh, you have placed us, your people, in this land made rich with rivers, forests, and mountains, and creatures great and small. Here you set before the founders and pioneers of this nation an opportunity beyond measure to build a realm of justice, peace, and freedom. Here you continue to call your people, freed them from the law and baptized into Jesus Christ to be a sign of your reign in all the world. For such a place, such a vision, and such a calling, we give you thanks. Praying we may ever join afresh the dreams you set before us as we join with your people in every land and on earth and with all the company of heaven we join in your unceasing praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Above all, we give you thanks for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who sends us into the world to declare the good news of your kingdom to every creature justice to all peoples, good news to the poor, release for prisoners, sight for the blind, and freedom for the oppressed. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, the night in which before he was arrested and sentenced to death by the authorities of his own nation, He took bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. After the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and he said drink from this all of you this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me and so we remember and we proclaim the mystery of our faith Christ has died Christ is risen Christ will come again Pour out, we pour ourselves out before you in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. So pour out your spirit on us and on these gifts. Make, them, make Christ known to us in the breaking of this bread and the sharing of this cup. Renew our fellowship in him that we may be for the world his body, poured out for the world at this time in this nation. And at that great banquet in the fullness of your new creation, where justice flows like rivers, righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, where none shall hunger or thirst, neither shall they learn war anymore, by him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning to my left you will see baskets. As these elements were consecrated, we also consecrated these communion baskets. They will be taken to the unwillingly absent, those in home, that are homebound or in nursing homes. They'll be taken by volunteers of our congregation so that others in our church may know of God's great grace and love for them, even though they cannot come to worship. In just a moment, we will invite you to this table, and I remind you that this table isn't the pastor's table. It's, it's not the church's table. This is the Lord's table, and we come because all are welcome. No longer how, matter how long it's been since you've been to the Lord's table, no matter if you are not even Methodist, you are welcome to partake. In just a few minutes, our ushers will direct us forward. We take communion by intention in which we will offer a piece of bread and invite you to dip it into the cup. We will have gluten-free elements that will be off to, the, to one side for those of you that need those uh, elements. At this time, I invite those that are assisting with communion to please come forward at this time. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Let us never be weary of well-doing. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
As Jesus sent out the 70, so now we are sent into the world. But we go in trust. We go in love. We go because our names are written in heaven. Go now in peace. The kingdom of heaven is near. Amen. Oh.